The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the Sea of Galilee is coming alive again. Prayers has been answered. See why Israelis are calling it a miracle. Then, eight-time All-Star and four-time World Series champion. Wow, I just couldn't believe how good I was. Daryl Strawberry talks about the thrill of victory. That's so amazing to be able to do the things that I was able to do. And the agony of multiple addictions. How did I get here from stardom to the pit? On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Iran shoots down a U.S. drone in what looks like uh, neutral waters. Are they looking for a war? And there's swarms of earthquakes in the Hayward, California region. Uh, is this a precursor to a big one or just uh, a phenomenon that takes place right frequently? We're going to be talking about all of that. Plus, the president uh, in one day has raised more money than most of the Democrats and all the time they've been in, uh, in gear uh, combined. Amazing stuff, but tensions are growing as President Trump sends more U.S. troops to the region of the uh, Iranian-Persian Gulf. But as Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson reports, Congress is divided over whether the president has the authority to enter into any further conflict with Iran. Here she is. Now that tension between the United States and Iran has reached a new high, the talk on the Hill is less about military action and more about Iranian aggression. This week, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell still warned the risks of a conflict are very high. But make no mistake, they're being driven by Tehran's decisions to resort to violence. McConnell strongly supports the Trump administration's decision to send a thousand troops as a defense against any further Iranian attacks in the region. There's no question that Iran is behind the attacks. Congressman Adam Schiff argues these kinds of attacks were, quote, eminently foreseeable after President Trump pulled out of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. And the fact that our reneging on the deal hasn't made us safer um, is part of the proof. Iran threatens unless sanctions are eased, it will exceed the limit of nuclear fuel allowed in the 2015 Obama-era deal in a matter of days. Uh, it's been our mission since the uh, beginning of this administration uh, to convince the Iranian regime not to move forward with their nuclear program and not to continue to engage in development of their missiles and all the other activities, the malign activities that they've been engaged in around the world. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says for more than a year, the administration kept up pressure with the goal of re-establishing deterrence. We need to make sure that we continue to do that so that we ultimately get the opportunity to convince Iran that it's not in their best interest to behave in this way. Reminding everyone this is 40 years of Iranian activity that has led us to this point. Unprovoked attacks on commercial shipping warrant a retaliatory military strike against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Senator Tom Cotton believes it's time to act with or without congressional approval. The policy in Iran has been erratic and opaque. Nobody knows what their plans are and why they're doing what. While minority leader Chuck Schumer acknowledges a problem in Iran, he wants the president to lay out a clear strategy. As we have learned over since the 60s, Unless the American people are on board with a strategy, it ultimately is not going to get their support and Congress's support. Senate Democrats caution the administration against taking action without the support of Congress or our allies. Meanwhile, Senate Republicans were briefed by a top diplomat from the State Department this week on the heightening situation. An offer leader McConnell says Senate Democrats turned down. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. You know, folks, it is a little strange. Uh, the president has abrogated the agreement with Iran to limit their nuclear uh, capabilities, and yet he's holding them to the same standards that were in that treaty, and he says they're exceeding them. That, that is a little bit uh, opaque, as was said. It's hard to understand exactly what's going on, but it is clear that 
we have said and many others have said Iran can't get a nuclear bomb because it has made clear that if it gets one, it is more than ready to use it against Israel. And they have that strange belief in the Mahdi. And you have to understand that a lot of actions that people take around the world are motivated by their deep-held religious belief. Well, they believe that in the latter days, the Mahdi will come. And the Mahdi will come in the midst of chaos in the world, and he will bring a, an end to that chaos. But before he comes, there has to be the chaos. And so as they wait for the 12th Iman of the uh, Mahdi, uh, they are more than willing to start blowing people up and to get the conditions for that uh, Muslim savior to come to them. Uh, it's, it's a strange belief, but that's what they hold to. So it wouldn't be anybody's, uh, uh, out of anybody's uh, uh, disbelief that the Iranians would want to start a nuclear war. And if they get the bomb, they have made clear they will use it against Israel. So we have to say, and others have to say, we will not let you do that. But at the same time, the president, God bless him, and Mike Pompeo have got to say clearly what our... Uh, views are, what the parameters are, and what we're asking them to do. Well, in other news, authorities arrested a Syrian, Syrian refugee for planning an attack on a church in Pittsburgh. John Jessup has more. That is right, Pat. Officials say the suspect is an ISIS sympathizer who planned to bomb Legacy International Worship Center in revenge, quote, for our brothers in Nigeria. Mustafa Musab Alawamar allegedly recorded a video of himself pledging allegiance to ISIS. Prosecutors say the bomb he intended to hide in a backpack and detonate by remote control would have likely killed many people in surrounding neighborhood, even if the church was empty. Undercover agents say Alawamer even suggested leaving a second explosive device to kill Pittsburgh first responders. He has been charged with one count of attempting to provide material support to ISIS, among additional charges. Well, stock market futures surged more than 200 points Thursday on news the Federal Reserve might cut interest rates later this year. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell announced Wednesday it's staying put on its benchmark rate for now and indicated it might lower rates later this year, if necessary, to strengthen the economy. But the bond market responded negatively, with 10-year Treasury yields falling below 2 percent for the first time in 2016. Well, President Trump raked in campaign donations after his Tuesday night re-election rollout, taking in nearly $25 million. This as Democratic candidates are taking aim at frontrunner Joe Biden, questioning recent remarks about his ability to work with segregationists in the past. CBN's Jenna Browder reports from Washington. One day after President Trump launched his re-election campaign, the race is already heating up. Trump raising nearly $25 million within the first 24 hours. This as the Democratic candidates begin to turn on one another. When's the last time we saw people stand outside for 36 hours in the rain for a political rally. I mean, his supporters are fired up. Tom Bevan, president of Real Clear Politics, tells CBN's Faith Nation the enthusiasm among Trump supporters and the money they're giving his campaign are both good signs. The irony of President Trump is he also fires up the Democrats in an unprecedented way. On the campaign trail, Trump will address some of his strongest supporters next week at Ralph Reed's Road to Majority. He's been focused like a laser beam on the faith vote. And uh, he's on the issues that are a priority to them. Uh, he's made promises and he's kept those promises. Meanwhile, Democratic frontrunner Joe Biden is facing headwinds after comments he made about working with segregationist senators in the past. I disagreed with the views of the segregationists. The point I'm making is you don't have to agree. Biden's you words receiving sharp criticism like from Kamala Harris and others. But to coddle the reputations of segregationists, of people who, if they had their way, I would literally not be standing here as a member of the United States Senate is, I think, um, it's just, it's misinformed and it's wrong. And Republicans taking heat, too, as Congress holds hearings for slavery reparations. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell making this statement. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. Uh, we've, you know, tried 
to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing uh, landmark civil rights legislation. Uh, we've elected an African-American president. For a century after the Civil War, black people were subjected to a relentless campaign of terror, a campaign that extended well into the lifetime of Majority Leader McConnell. Also today, Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee are frustrated after former White House aide Hope Hicks refused to answer questions about possible obstruction of justice regarding President Trump and the Russia investigation. President Trump insisting her work as a senior White House aide was protected. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Pat, back to you. You know, this whole idea of reparations is literally insane. There's no, as uh, Mitch McConnell said, there's nobody living today who had anything to do with slavery or the oppression of black people back before the Civil War. And if re reparations are paid, how much are pay to be paid? And to whom are, uh, are they to be paid? Who be is the beneficiary of this? A bunch of people who've just been born recently are going to pick up a, a, a windfall sometime in the trillions of dollars. How do you add it up? How do you count it up? What is the metric that is being used? Nobody knows that. The whole thing is absurd. And uh, to criticize uh, Mitch McConnell because of his stand is just ridiculous. He's doing the right thing. And no thinking person today should really expect reparations to be paid for something that was done 100, 150 years ago. Makes no sense. It can't be done. John. Had some troubling news to report. Suicide among 15 to 24 year olds is at its highest level in 20 years. A new report in the American Medical Association says it's the second leading cause of death in the age group behind auto accidents. CBN health reporter Lori Johnson looks at some of the possible causes behind this troubling trend. Out of every 100,000 young people between the ages of 15 and 24, 14 commit suicide, a sharp increase over previous years. Experts cite a number of underlying causes for this upward trend. The CDC points to drug use, street drugs like heroin, but also ones okayed by a doctor. An alarming 200 prescription medications list depressive symptoms or suicidal thinking as possible side effects. And the risk of suicide increases with the number of these prescriptions a person takes. Any drug that is affecting your mind, your mood, your feelings has the potential to cause a disaster. Most of the school shooters have been on psychiatric drugs, and a great number of them were on psychiatric drugs at the time or shortly before they committed violence. And violence and suicide go together. It's, are you going to turn your rage out? Are you going to turn your rage inward? Social media also comes under fire because studies show it increases the risk for depression, anxiety, and bullying. Christian psychiatrist Daniel Amen is particularly concerned about youngsters on these platforms, warning that parental controls can give a false sense of security. So even if it's safe, what it's doing is setting them up to spend more and more time on it as they grow. And all the research I know says that's a bad thing. As the president of the American Association of Christian Counselors, Dr. Tim Clinton says people of faith need to face the reality of suicidal depression in their community. The church, uh, the community of uh, believers out there need to get uh, more serious about mental health related issues and themes uh, in everyday life. We need to bring this to the front and center, the forefront of the church. Suicide warning signs include talking about suicide or feelings of hopelessness, contacting people to say goodbye, and giving things away. If you or someone you love struggles with suicidal thoughts, free anonymous help is available anytime by calling 1-800-273-TALK. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Pat? We've been talking about that swarm of earthquakes. Normally speaking, a, a bunch of tremors has a tendency to alleviate some of the stresses that would cause a big earthquake. 
And so th this is not the sign of the big one coming. It may be the sign of the big one being alleviated. But on the other hand, there are people who think that if there's a big swarm of earthquakes, it's a precursor to the big one. And we've all been waiting for the big one that's going to break over the Los Angeles area. They've had them up in San Francisco, but when you've got the uh, several fault lines that run through California, uh, it is an earthquake zone, and it is a thing that needs to be taken care of, and, and it can't be ignored. But uh, here's the story about what's happening right now in Haywood, California. John? Pat, the swarm of earthquakes you're talking about hit Southern California over the last three weeks, covering an area of less than one square mile in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Residents say they have felt the shaking and wonder if a big one is coming, but geological researchers say there's a slim chance there will be a larger quake. The swarms have an average magnitude of 3.0. And Pat, this area is right along that uh, ring of fire that you talk about. Sure is. And uh, the Earth is... You know, we have these big plates. We, uh, well, there's a magma underneath us, and the plates float on the magma. And there's a North American plate. There's a Pacific plate and so forth. And they come together. And if they break apart just a little bit, uh, then all of a sudden you've got a big fracture. and You've got all kinds of terrible things happening, especially in a modern city. And a lot of our architecture has not been prepared to, to withstand a, a, a quake. Well-built structures usually uh, stand up, and the damages from things that hit people when the buildings fall or when furniture falls and so forth. But uh, it's very scary to undertake one of those things. And when uh, that uh, north side earthquake hit, uh, my son Tim was in, was in it and started shaking, and it, it was a scary situation. Have you ever been in an earthquake? I was in one in Israel. Uh, I was in in a bed, sleep, you know, asleep, and all of a sudden I felt this bump mm -hmm. behind me, and I, I didn't know what was the matter. And the curtain started shaking. It was an earthquake, but it was far enough away, so it didn't didn't affect me. I any. felt one in. I was in Arizona, really, um, and uh, living right on the border of California. And back then, it was my first TV job slept on a mattress on the floor. Uh -huh. So when the earthquake came, it felt like something came into the mattress like this. Wow. And it felt like a like a roller coaster. And my roommate and I, we ran out into the middle. Of, her, her bedroom was here and mine was here. We ran out into the middle and hugged each yeah. other. <laughs> and it was really scary. Yeah. I, that was my first and only earthquake. Yeah, well, I, I'd just as soon stay away from them. But some of them can be very, very devastating. And yeah. of course, when you look at some of the fictional movies that have been about earthquakes, and but it could be that, you know, parts of California... Uh, with that San Andreas fault, it could be significant enough that you could have a, a, a large portion of a state opening up and, the, and the, the ocean coming in. So, But right now, we haven't had any of that, and I hope we never do have to. Wendy? That's right. Well, up next, a modern-day miracle from the Sea of Galilee. It's very, very good. Thank God from this. Okay, this is a miracle. This year, it's a lot of raining. So the level in the, in the Sea of Galilee has come up very, very good. Hear how the rising water is an answer to prayer right after this. Israel has led the way in water conservation. They develop what's called drip irrigation for their agriculture. Uh, they have led the world in the desalinization of, of seawater. As a matter of fact, they're selling uh, desalinization plants to, to the United States for, for use in California. And instead of being in a water deficit, they actually have surplus water because of their incredible technology. But one of the main sources of water for Israel has been what's we know in the Bible is the Sea of Galilee. And just six months ago, the Sea of Galilee was in trouble. There were drought-like conditions that had left the biblical lake at dangerously low levels. But a rainy winter has helped bring relief. Our CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has that story. For years, the Sea of Galilee has been shrinking. Then, this past winter, 
delivered a pleasant surprise to the biblical lake. I'm standing near the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Just six months ago, after years of low rainfall, the tourist boats behind me had to dock at the end of the pier. Now, after a rainy winter, things are looking up. A miracle. We have a lot of rain and snow that come to the Khirmun mountain. And usually we have about 350 millimeters of rain. This year we have more than 600 millimeters. It was a shock to the water in Israel. The last time the Sea of Galilee, or Kinneret as it's referenced in the Old Testament, was overflowing was in 1995. And it was nearly that full in 2004. In November, we visited Kibbutz Ginosar, and the water level looked like this. Now, it looks like this. Every time we arrive to the dangerous point, somebody do something for us. Streams like this one that fed the Kinneret are brimming with water. These trees were on the banks of the lake for years. Now they're underwater. This was all dry. Now there's water, and though the rains are finished until next winter, there's melting snow from the Hermon and streams still feeding the lake. Daniel Carmel runs the worship boats. He said in November they could hardly dock here. They don't know it. They don't know how is the Sea of Galilee when it's full. This is the lowest that I ever saw. Uh, 25 years that I'm here, this is the lowest. Now Joseph Gina from the Francis Jordan sailing ship says things have changed. This year it's very, very good. Thank God from this. Okay, this is a miracle, by the way. This year it's a lot of raining. So the level in the, in the Sea of Galilee, it's come up very, very good. While the water level rose about 12 feet this year, at the end of the rainy season, it's still seven feet from being full. If we would have had a drought of the year, a six drought of the year, then the situation would be very, very bad. Ori Shore is with Israel's water authority. And the rain also fell exactly on the right places from the water uh, uh, sources point of view. And that's also very important. And the spread of water, the spread of rainfall was very good as well. That's why you can see the streams run fluently and nicely and the levels of the water sources are rising nicely. Each summer, the water level goes down by four to five feet just from evaporation. And so far, this summer's temperatures have been extremely high. According to Shore, over the last 30 years, rainfall has continuously dropped while the region is using more water than ever. In Israel, the consumption of water is much higher than the quantity of rainfall that we get, not only in the Sea of Galilee, but also in other water sources. Therefore, we are in a deficit every year more and more. And Israel is not alone. That's where technology comes in. For example, Israel has recycled sewage water and desalinated seawater for years. Shor says without that, Israel would not have the water it needs. While the winter rain delivered a much needed miracle, the Sea of Galilee is clearly not out of danger. Last fall, Carmel asked people to pray. Prayers has been answered, hallelujah. As people here and around the world pray for this key body of water, Israel is doing what it can to make new water sources and preserve this unique biblical lake. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Sea of Galilee. Well, that's good news. You know, we haven't yet seen what's going to happen when the snowpack on the Sierra uh, Mountains begins to really melt. They're having way too much water uh, in most of the nation, certainly in, in Texas and places like that. And when that, that uh, snowpack really lets go, uh, it's going to be monumental what's going to happen to some of the water in California. It won't be any deficit. It's going to be uh, a massive uh, oversupply for at least a short period of time, Wendy. All right. Well, coming up, baseball icon Daryl Strawberry talks about the thrill of victory and the agony of addiction. The real rock bottom was in the Florida State Prison because of addiction. Not guilty of any crime. How did I get here from stardom? to the pit. See how the four-time world champion is taking on the opioid crisis after this.
Well, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club, and I'm so glad you're with us. Now I want to tell you about an amazing baseball player. His name's Daryl Strawberry. He's a four-time world champion and remains one of baseball's most feared sluggers. During his 17-year career, he struggled with two powerful addictions, drugs and sex. Today, he and his wife are committed to fighting the explosive opioid epidemic that's plaguing America. Daryl talked with CBN's Tom Bury about their faith-based addiction treatment center. We need to do with sin in this culture because it keeps us separated from God's great love. Uh, the depth of bondage is real. Daryl Strawberry was an eight-time All-Star and four-time World Series champion. Admired for his swing, but notorious for his self-destructive addictions he would later overcome. The slugger turned minister has since opened addiction centers in Florida, where he and his wife Tracy have answered the charge to take on the opioid crisis. You've learned a lesson over the years. He reminds you it's never about you. I think too many of us think it's about us, but it's about his plan and his purpose working through you to make a difference in someone else's life. Summarize your baseball career. Awesome. When you play it and be successful and be broken at the same time. That's so amazing to be able to do the things that I was able to do throughout my major league career. It's only a short window for you to excel, and then it's over, and then who are you? Does it look different to you now on this side of it? <laughs> That's a good point, Tom. It looks totally different now. When I look at old clips of me and I say, wow, I just couldn't believe how good I was. I never recognized myself as that. I enjoyed playing. I had fun winning. Your rock bottom. Well, I had a lot of rock bottoms, but the real rock bottom was in the Florida State Prison with a T17169 because of addiction. Not guilty of any crime, but guilty of the consequences because of my sins. And how did I get here from stardom to the pit? What do you find to be the most frequent source for addiction? What I find more than anything is, is how is a household? If you're not there and available for the kids and you're not pouring real things into their life, a lot of fathers don't understand why kids are broken because the father has never walked a, a faithful walk. And now it's allowed his kids to be affected. What was childhood like for you? It was very difficult. Uh, it was very challenging, uh, very lonely more than anything. And the brokenness of, of my life became because of the emptiness and the rejection from my father. You know, I found myself playing baseball because of my pain, which my pain would eventually lead me to my greatness and then eventually lead me to my destructive behavior because of the emptiness inside. Growing addictions nationally, what's the concern you have about this epidemic? The concern I have about the epidemic of opiate and heroin addiction is people are losing their life. And pharmaceutical companies are getting rich. Now, a kid 15, 16 years old, once they alter their mind, their mind changes forever. And once prescription painkillers come into play, they get addicted to them immediately because they can always go back and get more. It's just like a drug dealer on the street. Youth, what's between your experience at that age and their experience? As a person who has struggled with that and remember the fingers being pointed at me, I'm realizing today that our society is broken, spiritually broken. It's why we have such a uh, negative impact with addiction and we need to bring hope. People need to come back and learn to love people and help people right where they are. Are rehab agencies open to consider faith? Uh, treatment centers are more open and actually I'm turning my, my treatment facility into a Christian Christ-centered treatment center because I know it works. And I think the government is looking into more faith-based programs to come into play to make a difference. A person's issues, it re-involves their entirety. That's the only way you're gonna get well. I mean, we've dealt with it from so many different angles and it hasn't put a dent into what's happening. If we can get biblical principles back into people's lives, uh, people will get well. He brings about restoration and restore people's lives to wholeness. I'm a prime example. Addiction is addiction. Where else are we seeing signs in society? Sex addiction is very powerful. 
And that's why you see so many men get caught up in pornography, because it's a desire that has developed inside of you, and you find yourself in places that you can never imagine. And my sex addiction was very strong, um, and I lost two marriages because of that. As destructive as drug addiction? Yes, it is. There's so many struggle with it, and we don't want to talk about it because it's shameful, because you have to stop kidding yourself and stop lying to yourself and safeguard yourself. When we deal with those real inside issues, that's when we become overcomers. For those watching, whatever the addiction is, how do they confront it to become free? Commit to someone else and openly share your struggles. When we can get to that place, you can get delivered. You understand that he loves you right where you're at it, but Christ himself will never point fingers at you. He'll say, come as you are. Christ is here to rescue you first. Then he's here to redeem you with his blood. Then he's gonna restore you with his grace. That broad measure of deliverance for you, Daryl Strawberry, Jesus Christ has become a, a hero, a rescue. What does he mean to you? Christ means everything to me. I always wanted to know why I was created, not just hitting home runs and winning championships and making millions of dollars, but why am I here? And I needed to understand that. And when you come and make your commitment to Jesus, he will show you everything about yourself and he will deliver you and he will set you free from the bondage and the chains of darkness. Hey, that's a profound word, isn't it? Who am I? Why am I here? And the next question is, where am I going? That's a question everybody's got to answer. It's something that, that any thinking person will ask sooner or later. Who am I? What am I doing in this world? How do I fit into this universe? And here's a man who was an incredible champion playing baseball, but that wasn't enough. And these addictions got to him and ruined his life. But he's come out the other side because he knows whom he has believed and he is persuaded that he is able to keep what he's permitted, uh, committed unto him against that day. Now, we've got something called free indeed. If, if you have any problem with any kind of addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever, the addictions are pretty much the same thing. And it says, are you free and how you get free? Uh, we'll send this to you as our gift to you if you want it. Uh, I think it'll be a help to you. It's just a little simple booklet, but it's got some really important things in it. And you can dial 1-800-707-3377. Uh, well, uh, uh, and we'll send this to you free. But look, you don't have to suffer with this stuff. God wants to make you free. And he wants to get you free of dead works that you might serve the living God. He wants your conscience clean. He doesn't want you to be all cluttered up with guilt and, and bowing your head down, always feeling guilty. He wants you free. He made you as a free person. He made you as his child. If you want to do that, just call on the Lord. Say, Lord, I want to be free. I'm in bondage, and I want to be free. Okay, Wendy? Amen. Thanks, Pat. Still ahead, Pat tackles your email questions. A viewer says, my husband accepted a job, and before the job began, he was offered and accepted a better job, which starts six weeks after the first job. Would it be wrong to go ahead and work the lower-paying job for six weeks, then quit when it's time to start the better job? Your questions, honest answers, coming up later. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A video between a teacher and a student who was kicked out of class is one of the latest examples of disagreement when it comes to the discussion about gender and inclusion. In the student's recording, he asked the teacher why he got kicked out of a class for stating his beliefs, saying he wasn't discriminating, rather simply stating there are only two genders and anything else is a quote, personal identification. Well, book publishers are calling on President Trump not to impose a Bible tax in China. The president's proposed tariffs on $300 billion in Chinese goods would include printed material. Bible publishers like HarperCollins believe they will be particularly hard hit by the tariffs, making Bibles much more expensive in the U.S. and perhaps even lead to a Bible shortage. The president has threatened to impose the tariffs if Chinese, China's president, Xi Jinping, refuses to meet at the G20 summit next week. 
Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Millions of Venezuelans are fleeing their country and Operation Blessing is on the ground trying to meet the needs of these refugees as they cross the bridge into Colombia. Take a look. Fear, violence, lack of food and medicine have forced millions of Venezuelans to leave their country searching for help and hope. The United Nations has called this humanitarian crisis the largest exodus in the recent history of Latin America. On this bridge, thousands of Venezuelans cross every day into Colombia searching for help. Just a few blocks from here, Operation Blessing is strategically positioned to receive Venezuelans as they're coming in in search of help. Many of them are malnourished, dehydrated, and haven't seen a doctor in years. We've talked to people that have told us that they haven't seen a doctor in two years. They come to us at a critical moment. Operation Blessing is receiving these people. We have water filtration systems to give them clean water. We have staff of doctors that is treating their critical needs. We can't do this alone. We're here on the ground. And if you want to help, you may not be able to come here physically, but you can come alongside of us and partner with us by donating and helping us with your resources so we can mobilize our team here and continue serving these people. Thanks, Roberto. It's so encouraging to see that Operation Blessing is right there in the midst of that crisis and all that personal suffering. I mean, I just can't even imagine what those folks are going through, but Operation blessing is there. And if you are a partner with CBN, then you are there. Thank you so much. All you have to do, it's 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBN partner and to help hurting people all over the world and here at home. The numbers on your screen, 1-800-700-7000 is the number to give. Again, just 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes. When you give, we want to bless you back with Pat's dynamic new teaching called The Plan. This is eight keys to understanding God's will for your life. It's an amazing teaching, and it's our free gift to you when you call and join the 700 Club. All right, Pat, guess what? Right, let's take them. It's time for your e email right, questions. Lay it on me. This viewer says, my husband accepted a job after being laid off for six months. Before the job began, he was offered and accepted a better job, which starts six weeks after the first job. Would it be wrong to go ahead and work the lower paying job for six weeks, then quit when it's time to start the better job? Um, of course it would be wrong. Do you have any idea what a company has to go through? to make room for a new employee. There has to be employee orientation. They have to be all kinds of uh, uh, types of, of benefits awarded, and it goes on and on, and there's got to be a, a realignment of staff of other people around, and then you're going to quit after six weeks? No way. I mean, wait until the good job opens up. If you have to wait six more weeks, by all means do it. But yes, it would be wrong to take the job and then quit. Don't do it, all right? All right, J.S. says, I recently moved into a new area and started attending a church that is building another congregation in a neighboring town. I was informed that the church I'm attending purchased a church building that made national news for satanic ritual and child sex abuse many years ago. According to the Word of God, did my new church do the right thing by buying this building, knowing what happened there? Um, listen, uh, a church is a building. Uh, the church is the people the people who are engaged in this stuff are gone. There's a new congregation. But demonic presence could indeed be there. So I think if you're a new church, uh, you, before you take possession, I really would do what's called an exorcism. I would walk through that building in the name of Jesus and command Satan to leave it because you never can tell what spirits may have hung around. But truthfully, uh, buying a building is just a good building, and you can use the, the, the facility. There's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't hurt to have a little ritual of cleansing just in case. All right. I, I agree with you. <laughs> All, right. All right. Barbara says, I saw you answer a question about Satan infiltrating dreams. God also infiltrates dreams. Joseph had dreams by God. God told Joseph to take Mary as a wife. How does a person know what is good or evil? Does God infiltrate the dreams of those who do not know him? Please clarify. Uh, you're asking me several questions, and I'm not sure how to answer all of them, but uh, God speaks to us. Of course he does. He speaks in visions. He speaks in dreams. He speaks with the still voice of his spirit. He speaks by the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. He's, you know, the 
he speaks by the peace of God in their heart, and on and on and on. Um, I, I mentioned the fact that Satan indeed can uh, manipulate our minds if we open themselves to them. Uh, I don't quite understand what the question is. The spiritual beings can speak to our spirit, period, all right? All right. Marie says, Dear Pat, my question is about remarriages in the Bible. Is it true that if you divorce and remarry while your ex-spouse is still living, your marriage is not legal in the eyes of God? Does this law still apply today? Uh, I don't know exactly what law you're talking about. Uh, look, Jesus said in the beginning, God said, for this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Then he said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And he said, if anybody divorces his wife, except for the cause of, of, of fornication or adultery, uh, then he shouldn't be remarried. But we've got a situation in America where almost for every couple of marriages, there's also a broken marriage, a divorce. And there are millions of people who've got divorces, and they remarry, and they're trying to set up new families. And I've said all along, I think the church, which has been given the power of God to bind and loose, should loose this regulation and let people understand that God that divorce is not the unpardonable sin, and uh, the remarriage is not something that is forbidden forever. I, I, but I, I, I don't, it, it'll depend on the situation. There's the Pauline privilege, there's the question of desertion, there's what I would call constructive desertion. If the unbeliever is pleased to depart, let him depart, the brother or sister inbound, that's the Pauline privilege. And uh, I think if, it, if, a, if there's physical abuse and the partner is making it impossible to live with them, then in a sense they have, it is constructive desertion and it comes under those privileges. But the big deal is I really think the church needs to, to deal with this matter. I mean, as a body uh, and say, look, here's our ruling on this particular issue and cleanse people of this sense of guilt that they have been under because of, quote, breaking the law, all right? Yeah, we get this question quite often, don't I we? Know we do. Well, there's so many people divorced and remarried. That's why we get it all the time, because people wonder. And God's I, I just think, you know, but you've got to understand, if you just wanted to split, you didn't like your, your, your spouse, that's not reason. You've sworn a, a vow before God that your marriage will be until, de until death you part. The question is, what is going on? There's, there are facts and circumstances that have to be considered. All right, what else? All right, Cindy says, I have heard you give two different options on marriage. First, I have heard you say that you don't need the legal paperwork to be considered married. And as long as you're married by a union blessed by God, then you're married. Then I've heard you say that if you're living together without being married, you're fornicating. <laughs> Can you explain the difference between the two? All right, well, if somebody, a man and woman, are living on a desert island and they are together and they say, I marry you, I am going to commit my life to you for as long as I live, and I take you and go, he's got all the marriage vows, then in a sense you are married. That union has been blessed by God. You ask God to bless it, and that's a marriage. Now, if on the other hand, you're shacking up with some lady and you, you're, you know, there for a, a month or two or three or four or a couple of years or whatever, and then you decide, I'm, I'm out of here, and you go through all that stuff about leave off the key, and, uh, Lee, and get out the back jack and all that stuff, set yourself free, and you walk away, then you haven't had a marriage to begin with. Now, a marriage does not have to be solemnified by some city official. That doesn't make your marriage. It's do you commit to one another to live together in holy union before God for the rest of your life? That's marriage. And if it's merely a sexual fling, that's not marriage, okay? That, that shouldn't be too complex. I hope it isn't. All right. Makes sense. All is, right. Is that a... 
Yeah, I, th I think she's what she's asking, though, is, you know, do you need that? Does it need to be legal, not just in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of the state? Well, you know, if you want privileges as a married person, uh, you have to have the license and all that stuff, unless you can claim it's a common law marriage and you can count on that. But that's an exception. Right. So if you if you want to have the, the, the power of the state backing up your union, then you need to go through the formalities. But that's not what the question was. It's, yeah, God looks right. at the heart. All right. Well, up next, a woman battles a mysterious rash. I start getting really bad joint pain. I was having memory issues. I actually thought I was going to die. Watch. Watch how all her symptoms disappear in an instant. That's coming up. Wow. I want to introduce you to Mary Jo Andrews. Mary Jo thought she was going to die. That's how her dad, uh, her, that's her bad, excuse me, her symptoms got after a mysterious rash spread all across her body. And then one day, all those symptoms simply vanished. What happened? In May of 2018, Mary Jo Andrews suddenly noticed red spots on her arms. They were on my arms and my legs and the top of my feet. And I had one that went across my, my neck. There was this big red mark and it continued to grow. The marks were from tick bites. She contacted her physician right away. He said it was probably a rash. And it started to turn like a bluish, then turned like black, like a black and blue mark. And I was pretty concerned about that. The pain and inflammation worsened. She started having other symptoms as well. I started getting really bad joint pain. And I was having memory issues. It was like, I was like confused. I had no appetite. And I start losing a lot of weight. I actually thought I was going to die. That's how bad at the end, how bad it started to get. When the discomfort got even more intense, Mary Jo visited a convenient care center where they drew blood and ran tests. And they thought it was Lyme, so they started me on that doxycycline right away because it's really critical you take that medicine at the beginning. I did that, I started taking that right away. They ran another blood test and it still came back and then my numbers were pretty critical. The CDC only lets your primary care doctor provide so much medicine. The appointment was until like the mid to the end of September. And I told them, I said, I'm gonna be out of medicine at the end of July. And they said they couldn't help me. And I realized that there was only one person that could help me and it was God. <laughs> Mary Jo had always believed in divine healing. So she began praying. Then she turned on the 700 Club. And that day I said, you know, God, I said, I watch this every day. And nobody ever mentions Lyme's disease. And it was at the end of the program, and Pat asked Wendy, you have something else? I think that was the words he used. Wendy. Someone with um, symptoms of Lyme disease, God is touching you right now, and you are being restored completely in the name of Jesus. I was like, yeah, that's me. I claimed that and all the symptoms went away. <laughs> I started to cry because the power of God is so awesome. And to feel Him go through your body like that, it's just the most powerful thing. Since then, Mary Jo has been symptom free. Nothing ever came back and there was no need for me to even see a doctor because God healed me. A wonderful to you didn't know Mary Jo, did you? I sure did not. I, I remember, I remember because that's the only time I can remember getting well, that yeah. Lyme disease. Yeah, I'm so well, happy that I'm she sure. was watching that day. Isn't that great? <laughs> well, I hear a couple more. Uh, for over a year, 25 year old uh, Kushal or Kushal from Wellsbury, Pennsylvania, experienced problems breathing. One day, it was hard to believe he was watching. He heard you say, somebody, you're having problems breathing, just getting a really good deep breath right now. God's opening your passages and start praising the Lord. And Koshel knew that word was for him, and he was healed immediately. Praise the Lord. Here's one from Marcia of Salem, Missouri. She had uh, arthritic pain in her back 
Over two years, the pain became increasingly worse. One night, it was so bad that Marcia screamed out in pain and decided it was time to see a doctor. Before the day of her appointment, Marcia heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, praying specifically that someone with back pain is healed. By faith, Marcia believed this was for her, and she hasn't had any pain since. That's wonderful. I'll have to ask the doctor, forgive me for taking his patient away. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Listen, we want to pray for you folks. Look, with God, all things are possible. There's nothing impossible. And he heals all manner of sicknesses and diseases. We've got a short length of time, but Wendy and I are going to join hands, and we want to pray for you. Thanks. Father, we join together, and we pray for the members of this audience. Yes. In the name of Jesus, Lord, yes. touch them right now by your power, and may they experience the healing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's somebody, I believe the name is Malcolm. I, I think you heard that testimony of Lyme disease. You've had it, and God just heard your prayer, yes. and you've been touched. Receive an answer. Wendy. Amen. Yeah, there's someone, you are just so tired. You're so, like the fatigue is, oh, it's debilitating, and you're crying out to God. God's hearing your prayers today, and that spirit of infirmity and fatigue is leaving now in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. A number of you have been having your thoughts disturbed by demonic influences. And right now, God is setting you free in the name of Jesus. And may the power of God touch each of you in the, His name. Amen, amen. and amen. We, we leave you with this power minute from Matthew chapter 21. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with us. See you at this same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.